So hello, everyone. Thank you to come today for our presentation. My name is Sébastien Plouf. Uh, I'm a French Canadian. I'm the CEO and the founder of the company Defense Therapeutic that was founded in 2017. I would like first to thank Eve Toder to organize this event. It's pretty much appreciated. And thank you all for coming today. I would like uh, to uh, introduce my colleague here who will do the presentation, uh, Dr. Muti Rafi, who is our uh, C Chief Scientific Officer. He will do the presentation and after uh, we will be able to answer any question you may have. So from there, I'd like to uh, welcome Dr. Muti Rafi. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for being here to uh, listen to what we have to, uh, what we've been doing actually in the last few years at Defense Therapeutics. So what I'll be doing today is I'll give you an overview of the different uh, research programs we've been going through, um, show you how the technology is highly versatile, how we can apply it in different directions, different uh, verticals, in order to really develop multiple projects. So Defense was created in 2017. It's a publicly traded company. Uh, it's headquartered in Vancouver. Uh, having said that, our main research and development facility is in Montreal. And now we have offices in uh, Basel, and we're looking to actually expand in Europe uh, as, as, as long as the company is moving forward uh, in order to develop and uh, more products and more in our pipeline. Um, the company is actually trading on the Canadian uh, Stock Exchange, um, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange, as well as the OC, uh, OTC QB. And we have a very strong IP portfolio. At the moment, we have eight distinct patents that are covered in North America uh, worldwide as well. And the company is really developing projects or products that are basically uh, related to DNA, mRNA, vaccines, protein-based vaccines, cell therapy. We're covering things related to CRISPR. So we have a very wide perspective with respect to our technology. And uh, really the core of the business is based on the ACUME platform. Now the word ACUME or the acronym ACUME is, is coming from the accumulator. And as you'll see in a few slides, The objective here is to bypass a very big unmet medical need, which is to really enhance the accumulation of any product inside target cells. So uh, we're very lucky that to have really assembled a uh, great team uh, that has tremendous experience, whether it's on the preclinical, clinical, regulatory bodies, financial, uh, financial uh, knowledge. So a lot of diversified uh, members in our team Of course, um, led by our chief executive officer, Mr. Plouf, and we're really here ready to uh, move any project forward from the uh, bench to the bedside. So what's really the mandate of the company? So if you think about it, any company that is developing a product, whether it's an RNAi, an mRNA, DNA, protein, antibody drug conjugate, these products will eventually uh, be captured by the cell in a process called endocytosis. So it's kind of a opening the mouth of the cell, grabbing something from the extracellular environment so they can basically get into a structure called the endosomes. So the way I, I like to uh, present the endosomes is like the stomach of the cell. So anything that is captured eventually will be degraded so that the cell will be able to recycle peptide fragments or any kind of molecules they get as a source of energy as a source of protein for protein synthesis, anything that the cell really needs to move forward. So if you're basically developing a therapy, you can imagine that your drug will not be able to, to reach the intracellular target site because it will be entrapped into these structures, which will become highly acidic and will have a lot of enzymes that will just attack them and destroy them. So at the end of the day, 99% of your product will be destroyed before it actually reaches the intracellular site. So what Defense is bringing forward here is the EQ molecule. So this is the parental uh, molecule that we have so far. It's a very tiny, small molecule of about three to five kilo Delton. It's composed of two components. So we have the bile acid on one end, and we have a peptide sequence. In this case, it could be, for example, the nuclear localization signal, if you want to bring your molecule directly to the nucleus. So the way this molecule works is that the minute you tag it on a protein or a drug, it will eventually break down 
the endosomal membrane as early as possible. So it kind of mimics how viruses work. So it causes a chemical reaction that will damage the endosome, allowing your molecule to be freely diffusing or escaping into the cytosol. So by doing that, you're ensuring that your ADC, your RNAi, your antigen is delivered exactly in an intact form to the cytosol where then it could be captured or processed the, the, in a correct way. So if you think about it, this, this technology is highly versatile because you can apply it to protein or cell-based vaccines. You can, you can actually apply it to mRNA, RNAi, ADCs, and you can also develop variants, and that's the beauty of this technology. So you can play with the bile acid or the, the peptide sequence to develop a, varieties, a variety of uh, variants that will eventually have novel pharmacological properties. So things that were not related to the endosomal break. And I'll show you an example uh, in a few moment. So um, this acume technology could be applied in infectious disease. You can apply it in cancer. And in order for you to really visualize how this technology works, I have here for you an experiment to show you how the endosomes are basically broken. So if you take, let's say, a dendritic cell, which is an immune cell in our body that is, um, its main objective is to capture antigens, process them, and present them to T cells so you can activate the immune system. These cells are good at capturing and processing, so degrading things. So if you express in that cell a construct that has galactin-3, so galactin-3 is a protein that binds to carbohydrates, to sugar residues. And those sugar residues are usually in the cell, cell surface membrane or in the Golgi or within the endosome. So if you express that molecule, which is stacked the GFP, you notice that the entire cell is green. So what that means is that you have no specific localization of the molecule. It's everywhere. It's normally distributed. There's nothing attracting this molecule to a site specifically. So if you, if you add antigen X, nothing happens. Now, if you take the same cell and you pulse it with an antigen on which you have tagged or attached the AQ molecule, you start having those punctides. So green dots. What are these green dots? They're basically damaged endosomes that allow the molecule to move directly in and bind to the, carb uh, the carbohydrates. So that's how you can see now that the molecules can freely diffuse within the endosomes and eventually interact with uh, the sugar residues. Of course, uh, this technology has been applied initially on dendritic cells because we wanted to really demonstrate how we can recycle dendritic cell vaccines, a study that we've published in the prestigious journal Cell Reports Medicine, demonstrating how we can really potentiate the antitumoral effect uh, induced by dendritic cells or dendritic cell-based vaccines. We've also published a series of other publications. We'd be more than happy to share those with you. And here's another review that really just gives you an overview of the different applications uh, on which the acume could be um, used in order to develop different products or enhance the efficacy of products. So, so far, um, Defense have developed multiple verticals for the acume technology. Uh, I'll be able, I'll, I'll, I'll try to show you today an example of each one of those different uh, applications. So we can show you how we can develop novel cell-based vaccines, how we can use the acume to develop protein-based vaccines, how we can apply it to mRNA vaccination, how we can tweak that molecule and eventually develop molecules with anti-cancer properties. So we don't really need anything beside that molecule in an unconjugated manner and how we can also apply it in the context of antibody drug conjugates, whether you would like to recycle those that are available at the moment commercially, those that have failed phase two, or if you're looking to develop a new antibody drug conjugate. So, so far we've got two important programs that are moving to phase one trial. So um, 2024 is a very important year for defense because this is for us an inflection point where the company is moving from being a preclinical to a clinical stage company. So uh, the first program that I'll be talking about is the ARM vaccine. So it's a cell-based vaccine that could be adaptable to any solid tumor. Uh, we're currently talking to Health Canada to be able to get a clearance for a phase one trial. So the pre-CTA meeting happened early this month and we're looking forward to get the uh, CTA application in a few weeks from now uh, in order to have a phase one trial. Then I'll be talking about the Acutox, which is a variant of the acume that we could inject directly in the tumor and induce tumor control or regression. So that molecule has been cleared out by FDA for a phase one trial. So that's why we're raising fund right now so we can basically start our phase one trial as soon as possible at City of Hope in LA. 
Um, I'll be talking also about how we can use the ACUM on to developing protein-based vaccines. I won't be talking about the COVID vaccine we've developed in the past, but I'll just give you an example here of a tumor-specific antigen and how we can use that for cervical or head and neck cancer. And then I'll say a few words about uh, antibody drug conjugates and mRNA vaccination. So let's start with the ARM vaccine. So if you've been following the field of cancer vaccination, you'll know that the only cell type that has been used so far for the development of dendritic of, of cancer vaccine is based on DCs or dendritic cells. Now, dendritic cells have been around since uh, in the clinic since the late 1990s. So a lot of people try to use tumor-associated antigens, you know, NYESO, uh, MAGE, uh, these different antigens that are overexpressed on cancer cells. But unfortunately, at that time, uh, the reason why they failed is because we didn't understand the biology of dendritic cells, and we're still struggling with the idea of finding tumor-specific antigens, so things that are only expressed on cancer cells. So I've been working on mesenchymal stromal cells for over 20 years, and I believe these, these, these cells are fantastic. I call them basically a solution looking for a problem for multiple reasons. First of all, these cells could be easily harvested from any site of our body. Initially, people used to say from the bone marrow, but now we can isolate them from adipose tissues, umbilical cord, menstrual blood, you name it. They are easy to expand, so you can get billions and billions of cells with a chemically defined media that doesn't cost that much. So no need for cytokines that are expensive or growth factors. They have a wonderful safety profile. If you've looked at clinicaltrials.gov, uh, you'll see that MSCs have been used in hundreds of clinical trials with no side effects so far. Their plasticity is amazing. So um, these cells, you can initially they were designed to repair ischemic tissues but people have demonstrated that they also have immunosuppressive capacity. And we were able also to demonstrate, in fact, we were the first in the world to show that we can pharmacologically or genetically reprogram those MSCs to behave as antigen-presenting cells. So they're no, we're taking them from one end and bring them to the other extreme. So now, instead of suppressing inflammation, they can actually activate inflammation or activate an anti-tumoral immune response. So, what I'm trying to tell you here is that these cells could be adapted to your problem. And so initially, uh, following our DC-based vaccine project, we said to ourselves, could we reproduce the same thing that we've done with DCs by taking an antigen, conjugating the cum on it, adding it on MSCs, and then having an MSC-based vaccine? So we did an, a screening with a cross-presentation, uh, antigen cross-presentation assay, and unfortunately, we couldn't find any signal of or evidence of T cell activation with the system. Of course, the, the, the bar you're seeing here, the positive one, it's a positive control. But when I saw this, I said, okay, let's try another approach. Let's take the antigen and mix it with the ACUM or the ACUM variants and see what happens. And when we did that assay, one actual molecule we named the A1 gave us a very powerful signal. And of course, when we did some more in-depth analysis, RNA transcriptome sequencing, uh, cell-based assay, we understood that what this molecule was doing was basically, basically causing protein aggregation and turning on the unfolded protein response in the cell. So it's just the mechanism of defending the cell, uh, this, uh, the, the, the cell from protein aggregation, pushing this protein complex to degradation and presentation on the surface. So I'm just saving you a lot of technicalities here. So what is the business model here? It's as simple as this. So you have um, a cell processing center. So this is kind of a clean room that is used to expand MSCs in a GLP manner. Um, you've got a patient that is uh, coming to the hospital, has a solid tumor, sees an oncologist. The idea is we resect that tumor from the patient. We send it to the cell processing center to produce tumor lysate, so extract the proteins out of the tumor. And then we basically add the antigen with the A1 molecule on the MSCs for about six to 12 hours. And there you go, you have your ARM vaccine, the A1 reprogrammed MSC vaccine. So the process here, it means that we can basically generate a, a, an ARM vaccine adaptable to the tumor of the patient, given that we have access to the tumor lysate in less than 48 hours. So this is not gonna take you two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. It's a very short process. And the good thing is we have access to uh, GMP-grade MSCs from a master cell bank, so we have our supplier in the States, and this is a universal 
off-the-shelf vaccine. So it's not compatible with the patient, which is even better because it will stimulate a better immune response against the tumor. Now, um, how does it work in vivo? Um, here's some preclinical data on the, on the program. So if you take, for example, A1 and the antigen, you mix them, you add them on MSCs, you have the arm cells, you take them, and then you infuse them into animals that have pre-established solid tumors. There, what you can see, if you focus on the purple and the red line, so the black line is basically just a control for the tumor, so you can see how the tumor grows pretty fast. If you deliver the arm vaccine as a monotherapy, so on its own, nothing else, you'll see with the purple line that you've got some very nice control of tumor growth out there. And even though the tumor eventually slowed down and it grows eventually, this is a very, very powerful piece of data because a lot of these monotherapies don't work on their own. And when you basically combine it with the immune checkpoint anti-PD-1, which is one of the mostly common, the, 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 the most common used PD -1, um, immune checkpoint on the market, you can appreciate the fact with the red line there that you're basically curing all of the animals with their tumors. In fact, the tumor goes away, okay, with 100% survival rate. Of course, that was done with a, with a chemically defined antigen. So one xenoantigen, we wanted to then move on to a more aggressive tumor model uh, using tumor lysate. And so we replicated the same experiment, but now in the melanoma, so it proliferates pretty fast. And as you can see in this case also, the, the arm plus the PD-1 as shown in red shows a very nice control of tumor growth over time. Now, um, in animal models, this is very good as a data because it sh it, this is a tumor that is completely growing. Like in humans, tumors will take six months, 12 months, a couple of years to grow. In animals, this thing could be done in 14 days. So when you see that the response is actually delayed up to 40 days in the lifespan of a mouse, that's very good. So at the moment, we're uh, working to adapt our vaccine to hard to treat cancer. So we're really focused on both pancreatic and ovarian cancer because we believe one, uh, they're very aggressive tumors and two, they don't have any kind of therapy available at the moment besides, besides standard of care, which is surgery, chemo and radiotherapy. So our aim for this year is to really start a phase one trial. So of course, we've got a site at McGill University in Montreal to start a phase one uh, with the CPC already at the Jewish General Hospital. On the other side, uh, we've uh, we started collaborating or talking and discussion with a very prestigious MD at Wisconsin Medicine in the US, actually my uh, PhD supervisor, who's running the uh, clinical trials right now. So we're hoping eventually to be able to run uh, our arm vaccine trial against baskets of tumors, including ovarian cancer in the States. So that's what I wanted to tell you about the cell-based vaccine as an example. Now I'm gonna switch gears and talk about protein-based vaccines. So another example of how the Acume technology could be used in order to develop uh, any protein-based vaccine. So the model we chose was HPV. Now, why is that? Simply because this is the only um, organism from which we can actually have a tumor-specific antigen. Cancer is a multifactorial disease. It could be caused by genetic instabilities, mutations, ROS, um, anything. But cervical cancer and head and neck cancer are caused by a virus. So we know that we can actually pinpoint oncogenes as targets and use those to really cure or treat those patients. Now, Cervical cancer, so far, we're doing good worldwide because of the Gardasil 9 vaccine, which, as you probably know, is a mix of nine L1 caps of proteins targeting nine different subtypes of uh, HPV. However, this vaccine is only working prophylactically, so you have to give it to patients before they get infected. Once the patient is infected, the vaccine is no longer working or effective because the vaccine targets viral capsids and not cancer itself. So that's where people get confused. People think Gardasil is an anti-cancer vaccine. In fact, it's an antiviral vaccine. So um, we focus on two oncogenes, which are known to really drive cell immortalization, and drive cancer. So in this case, uh, we said, okay, we have E6, the E6 oncogene and the E7 oncogene. Why, how are we gonna choose between the two? In fact, we chose the E7 for three simple reasons. First of all, both E6 and E7 overlap by blocking P53, which is a protein that drives usually apoptosis. Second, E7 has two additional targets that E6 does not 
target, which are P21 and the RBE2F, both involved in cell cycle arrest and apoptosis. The third important point is that E7 is highly conserved amongst the different HPV subtypes. So you don't have to generate uh, different E7 vaccines for different HPV subtypes. So one of them will be able to cover the entire uh, spectrum. So could we use this vaccine, which is now a single protein against uh, cervical cancer prophylactically? So here's an example where we actually gave a prime boost of the vaccine. So at day zero, day 14, two weeks later, we challenged with a cervical cancer cell line and we follow tumor growth over time. So as you can see in this figure, um, the purple line here represents the Acume E7 vaccine, as opposed to the blue line, which is just the naked E7 protein. Now, not only you can see that none of the animals that were vaccinated with our um, Acume E7 developed no tumor, but that happens despite three challenges with ascending doses of cancer cells. So initially we gave a challenge at day zero, nothing happened. We doubled the dose at day 32, nothing happened. We gave a third challenge at day uh, 50 something and nothing happened at that point. So what that is telling you is that we've developed a very powerful memory response as well that can actually make sure that the tumor never grows. Now, even though this is really interesting and it shows you that the vaccine could work prophylactically, it's very hard to convince the pharmaceutical industry that we've got something that can replace Gardasil line. If Gardasil line is working, people are going to say, why bother? However, the next thing we asked ourselves is, could we use it to treat cancer, which Gardasil 9 could not do? So to do that, what we've done in this case is we transplanted the tumor first, then we gave the vaccine as a prime boost, so two doses, and then we started giving the immune checkpoints in parallel. Because when you, once you have therapeutic activation, you have to give those immune checkpoints to really make sure that your anti-tumor response will be not blocked by those PD-1, PD-L1, CTLA-4, CD-47, and whatnot. And as you can see in this case, we tested in that experiment both the PD-1 and the CTLA-4, which are shown in, in green and blue. And in this case, you can clearly um, see that the vaccine is working also therapeutically. So we can have a control over tumor if we combine the vaccine with those immune checkpoints. So there's some sort of a synergy happening. And by the way, the impact is even stronger if you combine the vaccine with the anti-CD47, which is one of the uh, latest immune checkpoint in development uh, at phase three. So um, we've completed the preclinical work for the Acumi 7 um, vaccine. We've done the GLP studies. So right now we're in negotiation. We're looking for partners to really develop this vaccine, either in North America and Europe. Um, against cervical and or head and neck cancer because head and neck cancer can also be caused by HPV. So that's a vaccine that we're really trying to push forward as an example of how we can apply QM to protein-based vaccination. So um, this is about protein vaccines. So I showed you how we can use it for cell vaccination, protein vaccination. Now I'm gonna say a few words about mRNA vaccines because everybody is excited about mRNA vaccination, especially after what happened with the pandemic. Uh, and, and now everybody is really focused on developing mRNA vaccines against cancer. So just a refreshment, um, mRNA uh, vaccination is nothing more than synthesizing an mRNA uh, sequence that codes for your protein of interest, the target. So the idea is you, you synthesize the mRNA, you encapsulate it into liposomal structures, and then you'd have to deliver those inside the cell. So we've all been vaccinated against COVID. It's the same principle. The major problem is, even if you do that, you'll be always facing the problem of endosomal entrapment and how we can actually deliver the product directly into the cytosol. So, and, and, and that's important because the mRNA won't be able to give rise to protein in the cytosol, so the protein can be released into the extracellular environment and captured by dendritic cells. So in other words, what I'm trying to tell you is that if your mRNA is entrapped in the endosome, it will not give you protein and trigger an immune response. That's why variabilities in patients are quite high. Not everybody develops the same immune response, even though we all got the same vaccine. Some people get sick, some people get sicker, some people are doing well. So that could be one of the reasons uh, related to the variabilities of this vaccine. So we've conducted um, so our preliminary work on uh, mRNA encapsulation with our acume technology, and we've shown that yes, naked mRNA could work, could induce an immune response, an antibody response. However, 
if you actually apply a QM with it, if you encapsulate a QM with the mRNA, you're basically able to increase the antibody titer by two to three folds. So you can really make sure that the antibody amount that you can generate is greater than the initial steps that were conducted with the uh, encapsulated mRNA. So this is work in, pro in progress. So our company is really focused on uh, developing now mRNA vaccines for multiple indications in cancer as well as infectious diseases. We're thinking here about tropical diseases, leishmania, malaria, in addition to cancer for this purpose. So, um, so this is what I had to say about vaccination in general. Now I'm going to show you how the ACUM platform could be manipulated in order to develop molecules with novel pharmacological properties, something that is not necessarily related to endosomal break, but could actually be used as an anti-cancer treatment. So that's uh, our Acutox program, which had clearance in the US for the phase one trial to be initiated as soon as possible. So initially what we were doing, that's, that's how we discovered the, the antitumoral effect of the, of the ACUM. So initially uh, with our DC vaccine, what we were doing is that we were basically taking an antigen that is biocon uh, bioconjugated to the ACUM, we add it on the resting dendritic cells, they become activated, you get a good antitumoral response. However, when I, when I saw this, I said, okay, well, manufacturing is always a big hurdle for a lot of companies, so let's minimize manufacturing, let's make it simpler. So what I suggested to do was to basically take the acume, mix it with the antigen, and repeat that experiment. When we did that, we noticed that, in fact, all of dendritic cells died, and this was unexpected. We repeated the experiment multiple times and we always got the same result. So then we said, okay, that's kind of strange. So we went and we, we started treating multiple cancer cell lines with the acute molecule, the original molecule. We tested it on the EL4, which is a T cell lymphoma, CT26 colon cancer, B16 melanoma, and 41 breast cancer. And as you can see in all cases, the signal for an XN5, which is basically um, a sign for uh, cell death by apoptosis, is always coming positive, although at different rates. So uh, B16 being always a little bit more resistant to the technology, to the, to the molecule. So what we did then is we started looking at variants. We said, could we actually enhance the antitumoral ability of the acume? And that's where we stumbled upon Acutox 001, which is, uh, as you can see here, has a very, very uh, enhanced IC50, like 30 folds better than the original acume, and it's able to kill, actually we tested against 14 different cancer cell lines, both murine and human. So no cancer cell line could actually resist it to the uh, molecule in vitro. So we're very excited with this uh, piece of data, and of course we've done a lot of analysis, both at the transcriptomic level, understanding how this molecule works, using reactive oxygen species, immunogenic cell death. It's been doing a lot of bad things in cancer cells, but the most important thing to us is does it work in vivo? So um, to do that, we went back to the animal models and we transplanted the tumors. And then what we did is uh, we gave the molecule intratumorally. So whenever you see the uh, black triangle, this is the delivery of the acutox and the red triangle is the immune checkpoints delivered intraperitoneally. So as you can see here, we tested Acutox alone as a monotherapy as shown in the red line versus Acutox with NTPD1, CTLA-4, or CD47. So these are all different immune checkpoints. And as you can notice in the black line, which is the best one we got, this is the combination of the Acutox with the immune checkpoint NTCD47. So this really shows that this molecule has a great potential in really triggering tumor regression if combined, of course, in synergy with immune checkpoints. <clears throat> So our plan is to run a phase one at City of Hope in LA. So the idea is to really follow a three plus three dose um, and we'll be using the molecule in combination with Obdulag, which is a BMS product uh, consisting of Antilac-3 and NTPD-1. But that's not it for the Acutox. In fact, um, we're always looking for new applications for, for, for this drug, for this molecule. Yes, intratumoral injection is great. We're even thinking of using it as a payload eventually. But one other thing we thought of is, could we use it for lung cancer? Because lung cancer is another problem. Uh, there's a lot of treatments that are being developed, uh, whether they're a standard of care, uh, targeted therapy, immunotherapy, combination of these treatments, but it's not working. We're, get, we're really having a lot of troubles with lung cancer. And if you look at the five-year survival rate compared to other tumors, 
lung cancer is not doing well at all. So 18% of patients usually survive. The rest are in, in very bad shape. So we're thinking now, I mean, lung cancer is a problem because you want to develop something that is non-invasive. You cannot really just poke the patient in the lungs. So we had to think about a more of a non-invasive non approach. And that's where we started collaborating with an American company where they have this nebulizer um, uh, approach of, you know, you can, you can take any solution and transform it in kind of a gas if you want. So the patient will just have to inhale it. And so we took that device and we conducted a, a study on animals. So what we did is we injected the animals uh, intravenously with a tumor cell line. And as you can see, those tumors, we chose the B16 melanoma because they replicate what lung cancer does. When they lodge in the, two, in the lungs, they form nodules. So every cell will form a, block po a black point. So that black point is gonna grow. And that's how you see here, the lungs of the animals with, that have just received PBS are entirely black, which means the tumor is just everywhere in the lungs. The animals were doing very badly. And that's really 14 days after the injection. If you could deliver the PD-1 through the nebulizer, you can see here the quantification of the nodules. You can somehow decrease some, you know, some of these nodules with time. The Acutox does better, but if you actually combine Acutox and PD-1 through the inhaler, the nebulizer machine, you can see now that the number of nodules is tremendously. In fact, some of them, we couldn't find any black nodules, visually speaking. So this is impressive now because not only we're able to deliver Acutox in a non-invasive way, but this is a uh, delivery where the PD-1 itself, which is usually given IV, is also delivered through the inhaler. So this is not something that PD-1 is being used for at the moment. So now we have a new formulation we can basically use for uh, lung cancer. So um, very exciting stuff. Now I'm going to talk about the last part of the presentation, which is really the ADC program, the antibody drug conjugate. Um, those of you that are working in the pharma or, or dealing with the pharma knows, know that the ADCs are pretty exciting for the pharmaceutical industry. Everybody's developing an antibody drug conjugate. Uh, AstraZeneca has been leading the field with Roche uh, against breast cancer. Um, so what are the antibody drug conjugates? They're basically three components. You have an antibody that targets an antigen. You've got the drug, which is your payload, um, chemotherapeutic agent. And you've got a linker to attach the antibody and the drug together. So that's what an ADC is. So of course, um, if you deliver the ADC to the cell, we'll be entrapped in the endosome, we're gonna be degraded, damaged, not released, the payload will not be able to re-release in the cytosol. So we took some commercially available um, ADCs, um, for example, Katsyla, we attached the acume on it, and then we, can, we conducted some IC50 dosing in vitro. So we're trying to understand if the acume, trying to show if the acume basically could enhance the therapeutic potency of those ADCs in vitro. Now, um, as you can see in those three graphs, you have a sigmoidal curve. Now, the simplest way of looking at this is that if your sigmoidal curve moves to the left, it means you, are, you need less antibody to kill your cancer cell, cells in vitro. And that's exactly what we saw on the uh, three different cancer cell lines here with acume uh, attached on Katsyla or attached on the uh, trastuzumab containing the alpha aminitin. So how much are we seeing enhancements? We're seeing between 10 and 100 folds improvement in the antitumoral impact. Now, this is amazing if the pharmaceutical industry is looking, for example, to enhance the therapeutic potency of the drug to really minimize the dosing because you know these, these antibodies are toxic to patients. Patients, for example, they're on Katsyla, they, can have, they, they will have to go through six cycles, pretty long dosing range. Uh, they develop uh, toxicity. Some of them are actually off the, the, the trial because they can't take it anymore. So if you can basically lower the dose and shorten the dosing period, the regimen itself, that will really improve the therapeutic potency. But of course, that's if you wanna recycle what's commercially available. But uh, defense is also really, really active on developing its own ADC, so something that belongs 100% to the company. So we have so far three targets we're working on right now. The first one is CD73. So why CD73? Because this has been shown to be a very important uh, targeting cancer. It's really overexpressed in a lot of different cancer types, ovarian, pancreatic, 
uh, breast, colon, gastric, a lot of indications for it. And there's a, I think there are 11 different uh, anti-CD73 antibodies that are currently being developed by the pharmaceutical industry. But our idea is not really to develop a monoclonal antibody, but to develop an ADC, an antibody drug conjugate. So step one has been completed. We've developed our own uh, MAB against CD73. Now we're basically conducting chemical linking with the different uh, AQ molecules or AQ variants we have. And we're hoping eventually in a couple of weeks from now to be able to have some potency data showing how this uh, ADC is actually much better than anti-CD73 that is available in the market or the antibody we have on its own. That's not it, um, because we're also targeting IL-13 receptor alpha-2, which is another TSA that has been shown to be highly expressed on glioblastoma as well as other indications. And of course, alkaline phosphatase, which has been shown to be a very important target also for pancreatic cancer. So a lot of development going on in the company at the moment. So over the years, um, Defense basically uh, worked very hard to develop uh, partnerships with a lot of different institutions, whether they are in Europe, North America, Asia. We're always looking to expand our, our network, uh, the research centers we're working with, the companies we're working with. Of course, the company is interested in different deals partnerships, licensing agreements, uh, co-development, you name it. Uh, we're, we're, we're really interesting, uh, interested in developing our own products as well, so bringing it from phase one to phase three to the, to, the, to, the, uh, to the market. So we're not closing the door to anything, and we can have um, a broader discussion afterwards, but the company has a lot of potential. And the reason I'm saying that is because we're not only focused on one single drug, one single target, one single indication. We're really focused on a platform that has the ability, which differentiates us from other companies. And this platform has the ability to, one, generate tons of variants. You know, there are about seven, eight, nine bile acids. You can use that, you can use in this molecule. The peptide sequences, you've got hundreds of those you can test. Uh, you can engineer yours. So you can develop these different variants, which will give you an extensive versatility of application. On top of that, you can develop an infinite number of products. So any ADC out there could be applied to, the acume could be applied to any ADC. You can, you can, you can use it for any mRNA vaccine, any protein-based vaccine. And you know this ability of generating new variants give you the, 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 the potential to basically discover molecules that have novel pharmacological properties, things we're not expecting, like the Acutox program. The Acutox program was not based on just destroying the endosome. It was discovered based on the fact that the naked molecule, the non-conjugated molecule, could actually trigger cell death uh, in cancer cells. So the way I see this company is that we're basically the next Genentech or the next Roche, hopefully. So with this, um, I'd like to thank you very much for your um, interest and time. Uh, please feel free to communicate with us uh, if you have any questions, you'd like to have access to data, more discussions down the line. You've got all the contact information here, and I'd be more than happy to take questions. Thank you. Yes. I have a question about the Acutox. Uh, remember the slides where, <clears throat> sorry, uh, you challenged uh, B16 uh, tumors with acutox communicated with or not communicated together with pd one mm -hmm. I was wondering whether the saturation in the healed uh, mice was normal, whether uh, the drug was causing some kind of fibrotic tissue uh, buildup in the lungs. That's a very good point. Um, we're actually conducting the study as we speak. So we haven't really, uh, that level, we're just interested to in the potency. Um, but we haven't really, uh, I mean, we, we were observing the animals initially to see if they have some signs of difficulties to breathe, movement, and we did see this with a lot of the control groups. In fact, um, some of them were not even able to move. Um, but we haven't noticed any physical sign uh, of uh, that the animals are not doing well. Having said that, uh, this is a excellent point. We're going to be looking soon at some histological cuts to be conducting to conduct more of an analysis on how the tissues are, if there's any fibrosis, uh, uh, blood vessels not actually functioning, uh, bleeding of any sort, uh, immunofiltrates that are not supposed to be there. So these, this is work in progress at the moment. Thank you.